Well, well, welcome, Christine, and welcome, um, colleagues. My name is Roger Mark D'Souza, and I direct our programs on global sustainability and resilience here at, at the Wilson Center. Uh, many of you are familiar with the center. We serve as a living memorial to President Wilson. We are established by Congress in his legacy. He's the only president to have had a PhD. And in addition to serving as president of the country, of course, as president of Princeton University. So in recognition of, of his work, we, we uh, focus on looking at different ways we can bring analysis and um, research and a more nuanced understanding of key international trends to the attention of policymakers and program managers by focusing on what is, uh, is innovative and what we've learned. So this is a very compelling agenda um, for us, and I'm really pleased that um, our session today is being um, done in conjunction with our colleagues at CARE because it really does take a village. Um, this is coming under the support of our maternal health initiative. My colleague Sarah Barnes uh, works with me on this program. But we're pleased to be able to do a series of conversations with CARE around these important health interventions um, in an international development perspective. So our focus of today Today's discussion is looking at the community as key to a resilient health system. And of course, we're looking at this in the face of natural disasters, conflict, and epidemics, which have the potential to devastate health systems. I myself, like our colleague from Haiti, I am from the Caribbean, and I've been spending most of the day um, over the past few days talking to journalists and, and others who are trying to understand the devastating impact that the recent events have had on these very vulnerable populations and also dealing with half of my family who lives in Florida. So really, um, these questions of meeting critical needs of vulnerable populations could not be more salient for us um, at this moment today. I'm, I'm really pleased that we have colleagues who have successfully managed to fly in from Liberia and Haiti to join us, and, and a colleague who's come in from Atlanta who managed to make it out just in time before our other colleague from CARE, Christine Galavoti, was is not able to fly out because of the weather. So really, but we're very fortunate that she's on the phone with us today, so we'll be engaging um, from a, with us uh, remotely. So I'd like to kick off the panel by uh, starting with our colleague um, from Liberia, Joanne Dalton, is this gender lead for Think Liberia. And she's been working with Think Liberia since 2007, with experience managing both Think Safe Home and the Juvenile Transit Center. She's a certified midwife with a passionate commitment to human rights, advocacy, and activism. And Joanne, are you going to tell us a little bit about THINK, who you are and your mission? Is that part of your presentation? Yes. Yes, perfect. So Joanne, and, and notice she said it's not Joan, it's Joanne. I'm handing it uh, over to Joanne uh, to kick us off. Welcome. We're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. THINK, supporting the resident Adolescent Girls, presented by Joanne Dighton, Touching Humanity in Need of Kindness, Think Liberia. What we do, I think, Think Liberia was funded during the post-conflict to address sexual and gender-based violence issue in communities. It is um, organization funded and run by women who believe in the power of women and girls to transform their communities. That's why we stand for, we work closely with the communities. Three program areas. One, we have the prevention and response to sexual and gender-based violence. This program provides services for both women and female and male. We have the protection and rehabilitation home. This program provides confidential sex shelter for sexual and gender-based violence. 
victims. And then we have the Economic Empowerment Program, which target provides services for adolescent girls and young women. Think sexual reproductive health and rights and gender programs. Holistic, holistic approach to program. We believe in a holistic approach where we look at the psychosocial aspect, the social aspect, the education aspect, the economic aspect, and then the health aspect. Our sexual reproductive health is integrated into our gender equality and economic empowerment programs. Adolescent girls and young, adolescent girls and youth, girls, young women, and boys go into their communities to raise awareness on women's political participation and encourage more male and boys to get, on, get involved. This is a program that we provide training for our young women and adolescent girls on women political participation at all aspects. Because as we know in Liberia, women participation in leadership at a higher level is very low. So we try to conduct this training with our young women and adolescent girls to go out into their community to create this awareness. And then we have a male that also involvement to go along with them to create this awareness. And the male involvement, we call them male champions. Why we call them male champions is because they are supporting gender equalities and women's rights in Liberia. And we call them the he for she. We love Ebola in Liberia. As we can see, we have the buckets and we have our lead uh, facilitator, uh, adolescent girls who were creating awareness. You see the photo there. One, we have poor infrastructure and health system. Our country, Liberia, was not prepared for the medical emergency. There were no ambulance, no PPE, and there was, we lacked training. So as a result, we have massive death of our health workers, medical doctors, they were all dying because we lacked training and were not prepared. Misconceptions. When the Ebola outbreak was pronounced, the entire country in the, in, was in the state of denial and blamed massive death on poisoning of water and accusing health workers of giving bad medicines and vaccines. Stigmatization. During the Ebola response period, there were many widespread stigmatization the Ebola survivors were stigmatized. Why? Because the misconception that we have, anybody that got Ebola will not survive in Liberia. And for this reason, when we have people coming all of the, the ETU and people become afraid of them, they started to stigmatize them started giving them name Ebola people, calling them but the disease, Ebola virus people. And they was not even interacting with them. The community was not interacting with survival of Ebola. And even their partners and spores abandoned them. So there were a lot of conflict with the Ebola, where we had spores, divorce, husband leaving their wife, wife leaving their husband and blaming or uh, the hospital for infecting them. Ebola and things work. 
programs, as I talk about our three programs, which has to do with the prevention and response to SGBV, the protection and rehabilitation, and the economic empowerment programs. During the Ebola, we have to occupy of the safe home. Because we have survivor in the safe home, we have to just temporarily close the safe home for, from the public because we have survivor and we they didn't want to infect them. So we have to transform our rehabilitation center into a transit center for infected children. We have to do that. So our rehabilitation home was transformed into a, a holding center for infected children. As we know, the Ebola virus left most of our children as orphans. Some of them lose one parent, and some of them lose both of their father and mother. So we have to hold them in there. And then we went up in prevention or reach to rural communities like River Cess. River Cess is a place in Liberia that to get there, the roads are bad and they are underdeveloped because more people are not reaching there. Or reach and prevention and school assistance. We were able to get funding and we got buckets, sanitation supply for community prevention and outreach and school assistance for affected children. Of course, we know that those children that was orphaned, they have to go back to school, were able to get funding to provide school assistance for them. And um, through our partners, at the town of Ibora, we never had internal funding. There was no funding given to us internally, but we have, we got funding, received funding externally to do our work. So we work in community prevention or reach in six communities in Maurice Rado. Why we choose these six communities is because it was or had a hit communities. So we have to go in there and get the community involved in the prevention of Ebola and sexual and reproductive health. Ebola and things work. Working with and in communities. Our target is communities, to make the communities to be resilient. As we can see the photo, we have our young women and girls who came to us and said, we have to move. They built their resilience and said, we have to do something about the Ebola outbreak in Liberia, in our community. They are from a very remote community uh, that called West Point. And our adolescent girls they decided to take the lead. And we linked them with UNICEF, where they gave them funding, and they were there to go or in the community and create awareness. As you can see them, the photo. They took the lead in that. We, uh, there were 200 girls in West Point wanted to get involved, so I talk about that. So they provided the information and the prevention, education. That's what they need, and they took the lead. Responding to community needs. As we can see, we have Ebola buckets for washing hands. And we, you can see the drum. That drum was, we put place it at a public area where people will have uh, access to washing their hands frequently. The first thing we did was a focus group discussion. We decided to hear from the survivor themselves what was it like in the ETU? What was it like? And some of the survivor told us that in the ETU, the ETU was not gender friendly. They had both male, female, and children in one room, one area. There were no place for female. No place for male. 
And they told us that all of their belongings were burned at home and even at the ETU. Everything they carried was burned. And the challenges they were facing after they survived from the virus, they told us that they started having complications. And some of the complications was eye problem, ear problem, skin disease, and joint problems. So we looked into it, and we decided to do distribution of dignity kits and education for our survival to continue washing their hands and don't get in close contact with our infected uh, Ebola sub, uh, uh, victim. And we, we call it dignity kit because we wanted to build their hope. And the dignity kit uh, 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 includes we gave them mattresses and gave them some personal items to start with. And that helps them to build their residence. Effective communities receive psychosocial support and cash transfer. You know, Ebola, everybody, it was very traumatic. So we have to do a lot of psychosocial support for our infected children that we have in our home. And how we did the psychosocial support, we did it for group counseling. We did group counseling where they were able to sit together to discuss their issue together and find a ways forward. Then we did individual counseling where we have social worker or counselor assigned to them to talk on their private issues. The cash transfer, as we say, I think we believe in a holistic approach. The cash transfer was something, it was a criteria for the victims of a survivor of Ebola. And they had a criteria, if you have your certificate that you passed through an ETU and you are an Ebola survivor, you get the cash transfer. So we link them up with Ministry of Health to provide them the cash transfer, and that was done. Establishing mechanism for alternative care. Most of our children who parents died, they were orphaned. We didn't want to build an orphanage room or open an orphanage room, so we decided to do a family tracing so that we can find relatives of the dead they are parents who have died, and we were able to identify our relatives that we train, and then we place them into the homes of relatives. Barrier and tradition, there were so many things that had to change. We could not do our normal barrier. Our bodies were burned, cremation of bodies, and no one was allowed to perform burial rites, which were bathing of the dead body because of the virus. Proper washing hands and distribution of kids and education. That's why we did at community level. We did the king shape care, survive, surviving relative were trained to assist to take in children of their dead relatives. Orphans by Ebola. Because of Ebola viral, viral disease, we could not take in new cases for the safe home from the police or sexual gender based violence clinic. We had a transit center for holding place for our children. Surprisingly, rape was still occurring among children. So we have to host them in that center until after the 21 days while we're doing their vital signs and checking on them before we place them in the safe home. Responding to sexual and gender-based violence. As you can see, uh, this is my boss. She's the executive director 
for touching humanity in need of kindness in the communities, uh, talking to communities memo. We saw an increase in sexual and gender-based violence cases in our community. So we said we have to move up so that they can be able to build resilience. The creation of one-stop centers for sexual and gender-based violence. Who are you able to create a one-stop center? What is the one-stop center? The one-stop center is the place that provides services for sexual and gender-based violence cases, where we have all of the service providers coming in one place. We have the nurse who's there to do the examination and order her the treatment and whatever the protocol, whatever the survivor needs, the nurse was there for that. We have the psychosocial person, who is the counselor, to provide counseling for the survivor of sexual and gender-based violence, or the survivor family, even the perpetrator family, if they go at the one-stop center, will provide counseling for them, and even the perpetrator themselves. Community dialogue on sexual and gender-based violence prevention. We conducted, we conducted weekly dialogues in 10 communities for five weeks and each five week each, and set up a community action group as a means of sustainability or prevention of sexual and gender-based violence in communities. We know that communities is where the issues of sexual gender-based violence, Ebola happen. So we, we actually train the community to form a action group where they were able to identify the issue that is affecting them and then using a the referral pathway, if that sexual and gender-based violence, we had a referral pathway that they were trained in to refer their cases at the one-stop centers. Collective actions. For think we believe in a collective action. We work with people to complete our services for survival or even our community, and we feel that's the way people can become resilient. Not just looking at the health aspect, we look at the health aspect, we look at the psychosocial aspect, we also look at the education aspect, and that's how we work. This is the work of many. Think Liberia was a critical partner in working across many levels. We work with our local leader, which is the community, nationally, regionally, and globally. Started a work with the individual and community. We start our work with individuals and community to build resilience. Connected support from regional partners, African Union, ECOWAS, and OMI. Because we were, all, we were all confused, so we needed other partners to come up so that we can sit down and strategize how can we uh, curtail this Ebola virus in Liberia. So we had a series of meetings, and we were able to curtail it. Community got heavily involved and cooperated with the Ministry of Health and Partners. We make the community to take lead. How the community got heavily involved? They were able to provide the information to community members. They were able to report sick people. Anybody that is sick in the house, they were able to report that. The community took the initiative. When they have a stranger, stranger a strange person, or stranger in the house, they have to report, yes, we have a stranger in here because people were getting infected and just moving from one location to another. They were able to report when somebody died, they have a dead body, and that family is trying to keep the dead body, they will report it. So that helped us a whole lot. The community took the lead. We were able to reach out to international partners because uh, funding at local, uh, uh, funding at national level was very, 
No, we were not getting funding, so we had to reach out to international partners and to enable us work do our work. The resident, the resident community. Resident is a skills that thing uses to help beneficiary and community to cope with issues that affects them. That's the skills we use. Women voices matter to residents. And I will just look at the first era where we have peace building. During our civil crisis in Liberia, the women movement, we were very strong. We decided to come together as women. We had the women from the 15 counties. We have women from the Muslim, women from Christian background, women, displaced women. All of us came together. We said we have to come together. So, because our voice matters. We came together and we decided to do a set in action. Because our children were dying, our husband was dying, our family was dying. We decided to meet the warlord. We built our resilience and we moved. We met the law, warlord, told them that we need, we need our statement, that we need immediately ceasefire. And we also went, we extended to Ghana, where we met Equus and told them we needed ceasefire. We got at the Capitol building in a thousand of women, all of us were dressed in white, we sat down on the floor in front of the Capitol building. And when our representatives and senators came to work, they could not go in their building, they were just standing. But the women could not talk to them, we had only one foot pressing. And one of the senator came to us and said, women, what is happening? Our sport man told the women, say, the woman said, you have to take out your shoe and sit down on the ground before we talk to you. <laughs> and the senator took out her shoes and sat on the ground, and we told her that we need ceasefire now because our children are dying, and we need ceasefire. And we want you to make the appointment that we want to meet that time um, our former president, Tito, was. So uh, she made the appointment and we got to the mansion. We went in thousand again. We walked to the mansion from the air fee. We went to the mansion. We all sat on the ground. And then our leaders moved up to the platform. And they sat down on the ground. And then the president said, no, you can't sit on the ground. The women said, we sit on the ground until cease fire. You have to cease fire and stop killing our children, stop killing our husband. And that's how he took uh, some money and gave it to the women. We said, we are not here for money. We're here for cease fire. <laughs> and that's work. And that's why we have the peace today in Liberia. So women voices matter to residents. We, we built our residence and step up for peace, and we have it now. Emergency res response. Thing was heavily involved with the emergency response because we went at community level. Women most impacted. Women was the most vic victimized because they have to care for their children of the Ebola virus, care for their husbands. And I tell you that we got the information that if a survivor of Ebola, they spend the 90 days. And we had this woman who spent 120 days. She wanted to please her husband after 120 days, and she had sexual intercourse with that man, and she got infected and died. So women was impacted more. The resilient girl child. Innovative, they are innovative, they are smart, they are powerful, they are committed. The girl children we work with are empowered 
And our role is to strengthen system in support of their needs. And if think Liberia had more funding, we will build up a resident individual or resident community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joanne. What powerful testimony. I want to take off my shoes and sit down and, <laughs> and talk. Um, so you, you use the word resilience quite a bit. You, you, you talk about it at various levels. You talk about it as a skill, as a way of operating, as a, a move to action, as a negotiating point. Uh, you use it in terms of leverage. How do you define resilience simply? You meet someone who's not involved in this work and they say, okay, you know, we see the countries at war, there's civil war, there's displacement, there's fighting. What does it mean to be resilient in that context? Well, it means that you're able to cope with whatever situation or conditions that you are faced with and move ahead. You will set back. You have to move ahead. You have to cope with it and move ahead and take action. And that's why Think Liberia was able to take action on the emergency response. We took action. We moved into our community and got the community involved heavily, even for the sexual and gender-based violence cases that we receive. We moved into our communities. We train our communities to take the lead in that process. So resident is coping and uh, accepting the condition and moving ahead. I think that's one of the best definitions of resilience I've heard. <laughs> you cope with it, you move ahead, and you take action. I think those are really three uh, critical components. Thank you, Joanne. That was um, very, very um, powerful. So we move now to our colleague from Haiti. Dr. Ricardo Federic is an, an OBGYN. He's currently the deputy chief of party for USAID's maternal and child health survival program, Service de Santé de Qualité pour Haiti. It's a project working to strengthen the Haitian health system and improve health service delivery through the use of of high impact technical interventions. He has previously worked uh, for the International Training and Education Center for Health in Haiti, the Palihi Project on HIV AIDS Prevention, and as an OBGYN specialist at uh, one of the key hospitals um, in Haiti. So, um, Ricardi, welcome, and I hand it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm pleased to be here with you in order to share the work that we are doing in Haiti with the community we serve in order to support the healthcare system with the, in order to ensure better services to the population as part of the USAID and CSP initiative uh, managed by GH Paigo. Okay, if I can just ask you to speak into the microphone. So we're webcasting. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So by doing that, uh, I'll be walking you through my presentation using the out this outline by proposing uh, uh, some definition of resilience definition of our community mobilization strategy, and presenting some concrete action that uh, we're able to make in our maternal and child health programming in Haiti, and go through some challenges, and, go, and then we will be ending the presentation by talking about the way forward in order to have more equitable and resilient health system in, in our communities. So, in fact, resilience, um, is, I mean, w there, are, there is no commonly accepted definition of resilience that is used across all disciplines, because each discipline is looking at it in a different uh, scope. However, I was very pleased to this, uh, uh, this definition that I found in the Carey report that stated, uh, resilience is an inherent and dynamic 
attribute of the community. This means that it exists throughout the life of the community. Potentially, it can either be determined absolutely or at least change in the community resilience can be detected. In the Asian context, I would say that Haiti is socially structured to have a strong overall resiliency. But, uh, you know, our communities, they are strong, and this can be linked to our tribal roots and slave history, which carried into the, even the voodoo traditions, which remain in very important pillars in our culture. The con in the countryside, the villages, they are most often people are interrelated, giving them, you know, genetic reasons to support each other. So this tradition carries into the culture, even in more anonymous cities where you can see food merchants giving away food to, to the truly hungry, including sweet food, a sweet dog. And for us at SSQH, we have seen resilience as a community empowerment through, some, through strong community structures, like we did by putting in place health committees working with communities using their own resources to find sustainable solutions to healthcare issues that they have identified themselves. We believe that uh, the community is the cornerstone of the health system and the basis of, it, of its resilience. Only community inputs can guarantee that the health system meets the population needs. Community should then be the key component of the health system it provides a strong anchorage to ensure quality of services and some sustainability of the interventions. I know most of you know the six pillars of the, that WHO used to define the health system in order to provide services to the population. Community involvement, ownership, those can be nurtured and supported through a community monetization structured approach. SSQH used the community action cycle for community empowerment and participation, which we're going to present to you that has with its, its seven phase in order to obtain engagement of the people to resolve their own health issues. So we have seven steps that started by the creation, you know, prepare the community to, 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 to be mobilized. This started by the creation or, and training on, of the departmental committee and the county committee in Haiti. We talk about uh, communes, but they are equivalent of county here. And then from there, we organize those, peop those, those people that are actually chosen by the community, by the natural leaders, elected leaders, and um, we kind of oriented them by having a what we call transfer of competencies so they can have skills in you know, planning process, organizational development, and um, community diagnosis, and problem solve even solving and decision making. Once we do that, so we, they are ready to move in the next step so they can explore and look for the challenges that they are facing and decide how to set their priorities. And then we accompany them in, uh, in order to, to come up with a plan of action, a community plan of action. And then they are ready to act, to take action, and then they can um, decide on what activity they want to, 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 to organize. And from there, those community move forward and after implementation, so they can evaluate and decide, and from this evaluation, decide to either continue, take on another, organ another, uh, another challenge and move forward. So, and then they start back again, you know, with this cycle. We believe that uh, when we're talking about this, for us, we can, those words matter a lot, I think. Partnership with the community, uh, engagement, participatory diagnosis, diagnostic, 
participative management, participatory decision-making process, community dialogue, communication, those are very important and they will lead definitely to empowerment, autonomy, sustainability and efficiency. And I think those are very important for us in order to guarantee that we can, uh, we can bring services to the community at the lower level. Because the characteristic of our project actually is to make sure that we're working in the hot, very difficult um, part of Haiti, covering the 10 uh, regional uh, areas, but really working at um, providing services to the hard to reach communities, people living scattered in mountains, those 40% of the population that doesn't have access to primary health care services. And you all know all the, I would say, the profile of Haiti with, you know, high maternal mortality ratio, low intake in uh, um, um, family planning uh, um, prevalence, let's say 31%, you know, utilization of modern method of family planning, high uh, child mortality, low immunization coverage. So you understand that for years and years we have been doing, we have been doing interventions, but we, we believe that by taking this as a vehicle in order to strengthen the entire health system, this is the way to go. So that's why we work with key players, which are the community at first, the different stakeholders, and we work at strengthening the different level of the health system in order to ensure that service can be delivered and to improve accessibility. So we have, we have here a diagram where we show exactly at what level we, we intervene and how we interact with group in the community at the very beginning in the household level where we have different support groups and at the community level, you know, where we work with basically the leaders to come up with the health committees. At the county level, in, at, in the catchment area of the health system, of the health facilities, where we work with community health nurses, the, what we call the, uh, the CMOs, which are community mobilization officers, and the nurses that are there to provide services in order to you know, mobilize the team, work with the community. And at departmental level, in order to work with the various stakeholders that we have, the decision, the, the key players, in order to move forward. So, several examples from our organization and our program can illustrate how the community can really support the health system and make it more sustainable, make it more more efficient. And uh, from the committees we were able to put in place uh, with our cycle of action process, one of them illustrate itself, I know several of them, but one the first example I will give you is one, one committee from an area called La Victoire in the northern part of the country that was able to put in place a solidarity fund and to enable um, pregnant women and breastfeeding women to have access to phone in order to support transportation to go to the hospital in order to seek care. They, they even moved forward and were able to, now they are providing resources for women that cannot buy uh, medicine by their, by their own. Recently, on the wake of you know, Irm, uh, Hurricane Irma, uh, Irma, they were able to um, accompany, go in over other, other areas and help uh, the local authorities mobilize the community, help in evacuation. They get recognition from the mayor of the city. They open their own Facebook page and they are communicating and they are moving forward. So this, this very <laughs> committee, the same committee, they have identified other issues, other determi determinant of, I mean, have determinant with other sectors. So they were able to plan reforestation 
uh, session with school students. They have been promoting safe drinking uh, water and distributing, uh, uh, you know, uh, clean water, I mean, aqua tab tablets to reduce incidence of fecal diseases. Well, those, all those examples are really start small with, uh, I would say, doable action um, that they are taking. Those little steps, you know, will help them definitely boost their self-esteem and progressively make them um, build the perceivability to work. So those are really very encouraging uh, step. And you're going to see tho those pictures where they are working uh, in the community um, for def fighting deforestation, working on, here we have the health community the, that raised awareness, you know, for community activities. We have uh, other pictures showing, for instance, school day activities where children are mobilizing and taking action to, to encourage uh, uh, others to protect uh, the environment and, pla and plant more trees. We have students gather you know, with the community, all those pictures are very you know, encouraging action. We have another example that is coming from uh, um, another, another area in the northwestern part of Haiti, a, a city called Bedouin, where after the Hurricane Matthew, I mean, the community gathered together to restore the health center because it, there was a flooding and it was not functional. So this community, they come together and you can have images of the flooding and immediately they help, they, su they support the health system, they support the healthcare providers setting boots to, to, have, to make sure that services are maintained even under a tree while they worked in order to restore the health, the health center. We have images of the cleanup. Even, the, the, the even um, private entrepreneurs that had a, 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 a truck came and helped remove uh, uh, the mud. So everybody works together in order to ensure that services could be restored as soon as possible. And you can see pictures of the health center after, after they, they did the cleaning. But still, with all the interventions, we are uh, very optimistic, but we need to, we ought to say that we have some gaps that need to be addressed in order to make sure that we can really tend to a more re resilient health system in Haiti. We have to say that the system itself comes with a lot of difficulties, limited coverage of the health system, the type of organization that we have in the health system, the weaknesses that are inherent to the health system, are really barriers that we need to overcome. And you know the power dynamic that, you, that we have currently between health providers and the community members need to be changed. And the behavior where the health provider is, is want to keep its privilege to be you know, a savior, and the population is looking at it, him as a savior as well. And we know that we need to kind of make it make it mo a matter of uh, looking at uh, healthcare, um, in public healthcare approach, we need to make it more intersectorial and make it open. So regarding the community level, we need to do more training in order to make sure that the community is empowered and can question the system, request for better services, but it's also difficult with a community where that is facing social, economical hardship. Population that is living on a survival mode is less likely to get involved in collective action. But it takes, it takes resources in order to do so. And also, we need to say that the lack of, lack of Koreans, lack of Koreans, sorry. Oops. The lack of coherence, uh, um, okay, and continuity 
or in the community mobilization and intervention that are being carried uh, by different stakeholders in the community uh, spoil the intervention as well. The multiplicity of community participation approaches is an issue. So we need to come up with more standardized intervention. So in this venture, we see the way forward toward more equitable and resilient health system and communities by really working on the sense of moral of social obligation that we have so others can help foster other kinds of resiliency. If the human capacity and knowledge can be raised to help people help others in more effective ways. So we can have engagement and participation that will definitely increase service uptake across all domains. This is what we are working upon in order to make sure that services are available and accessible. That will help also help improve spending to be more streamlined, help find alternative ways to finance community outreach activities, and change the power dynamic between community health workers and the community. <laughs> As we said, once we reach that level, once we reach that point, the pressure for good services should come from the community because they are informed, mobilized, engaged, involved in resolving their own healthcare issues. We at FFH had benefit from lessons from other programs in Haiti, and we are currently contributing at defining a national guidelines for community mobilization and participation. And I think this is one critical step that needs to be taken in order to really structure and, uh, and move forward with this initiative. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Ricardo. I think it's really good to see some very positive images uh, coming out of Haiti. I think very often I am asked, is there, is there any hope? Is there a possibility for any um, resiliency coming out of Haiti? I, I was quite struck by your last statement. You say that the pressure for goods and services should, from, should come from the community. And you, you mentioned a number of gaps that seem to be very systemic. And I know that throughout my work um, at the community level throughout the world, I've had a number of community members tell me, Roger Mark, I'm tired of being called a resilient community. Enough, okay? This focus on the community level and labeling us as a resilient community means that um, those who should be taking the action at a policy level is almost let off the hook. And then the approach becomes less focus on the communities, less develop resiliency at that level, and no, no action happens um, elsewhere to address the systemic gaps that you talk about. What, what do you think? What's your perspective? My I make you smile. No, no, my perspective, based on our model, actually, is to put the, com the community in the driver's seat. So it's not just um, a, s a slogan. It's not just, it's, it's, a, a, it's, a mode of, it's a way of thinking. It's a way to act. And with this, com uh, this is the CAC model that we have described, this is, you know, I like to call this the vehicle that should bring us to, um, that will should allow us to bring services to the community. You know, we have been spending a lot of money, I mean, the international community is spending a lot of money uh, to, to put in place you know, capacity building project, health system delivery uh, project in Haiti that are very costly. And uh, we have been working with the community by being, uh, you know, by putting them in a, you know, um, observational mode. They see us coming, telling them, this is what, the, here is your problem, here is what I'm going to do for you. We want this to change by instead discussing with them and asking them what they perceive as being their problem 
And then we can, by transferring the competencies, accompany them so they can solve, decide in, or in prioritize on their issues and use their own resources in order to address them. This will bring sustainability. This will bring efficiency. And this will strengthen the healthcare system. Great, thank, thank you very much. So we're gonna to move to our final speakers. So it's, it's gonna be somewhat of a joint uh, presentation. Christine Galavoti is the Senior Director with CARE's Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Team. She oversees global learning, innovation, and impact for sexual, reproductive, and maternal health and rights. Uh, Christine is listening in on the phone and will provide additional comments as we move along and can answer questions later in the program. Her colleague, it will be Say Wako is a technical advisor with CARE's Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights team. She has over a decade of experience working with grassroots national and international organizations that address reproductive health rights and justice issues, including Think Liberia. That's right. So, um, it will be Say, welcome. I, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Christine couldn't make it today, um, but we are a resilient bunch, so I will take on <laughs> this presentation, and she's, she's on the call. She'll be able to, to give a few notes in the end and answer some questions. Um, I'm really happy to be here today, to be able to both hear the salient applied powerful examples that um, my fellow speakers have provided, but also to help illustrate the ways in which um, care works with community. Um, in building responsive and resilient programming. When cholera broke out in 80, in October 2010, agencies rushed to respond. A huge public information campaign was launched and well-equipped treatment centers were rapidly erected, like this one, scheduled to open the day after the photo was taken. A few hours later, however, it was firebombed by a local community and burned to the ground. What went wrong? Many in the community believed the treatment center was a source of disease and they thought locating, locating it near the community would spread rather than alleviate suffering. The comments reflect not so much the lack of information, but the lack of trust, something that public health information campaigns alone cannot address. Fast forward to West Africa, 2014. This photo of military personnel enforcing quarantine imposed in Monrovia increases, ten increases tension and fear between communities and the government. In the same capital, crowds attacked a treatment center to free family members from what they saw as incarceration in a dangerous facility where their loved ones would be left to die. Events like this occur in every humanitarian response, time and time again, when partners come in and do not work with community in helping shape and inform programming. So what does this mean for how we build a responsive and resilient health system, and what's CARE's approach? Well, the cholera story provides a dramatic example of why we think a health system properly understood is not just a health delivery system, but also a community system in which health is produced and inhibited. Both parts of the system are critical, not only in emergency response, but in both development and humanitarian contexts. Therefore, to build an effective, responsive, and resilient health system, we believe in three things. Firstly, we believe we need informed and empowered communities. Communities are the center of the system, and it is only with their full participation, insight, and support that we can build strong and resilient communities. Second, we need empowered and equipped health providers that have the training, information, supplies, support, and confidence they need to provide quality services. And third, we need spaces for dialogue and negotiation between communities, health providers, so that both sides of the system are working together to ensure high quality information, supplies, services need, or reach the folks who need it. If we focus on the whole system, the community and health delivery working together to produce health, we will be much more likely to build resilient systems, a system that can anticipate risk absorb shocks, adapt to evolving conditions, and transform the conditions and drivers of risk and build lasting resilience. Joanne, I, this reminds me of your definition <laughs> too in many ways. So let me give you some examples of what a resilient system might look like. 
how a program could effectively anticipate, absorb, and respond to conditions on the ground. What you see in this picture is not an island, but a mud mound. The people who live in this community build mounds to live on for approximately six months out of the year because the region is virtually underwater because of flooding. The region also has the poorest maternal newborn health indicators in Bangladesh. In 2012, for example, 11% of births were attended by skilled attendants. Given this context, it is not surprising that the government has found it extremely difficult to recruit and retain adequate number of trained providers to serve the region. The resulting gap is filled by unskilled private providers, and people are paying for this quality service. 67% of health costs are covered out of pocket in this region. So, to build an effective health program in this context, in 2012, CARE, local partners, and governments came together to develop a unique public-private partnership. With funding from GlaxoSmithKline, we developed and deployed a cadre of private skilled attend community birth attendants to complement um, the public service. The women are selected from the community. They are trained with government accredited curriculum for six months and also trained on business skills, how to promote their businesses, collect fees. Um, when they are deployed in the community, the government supplies them with needed commodities and connects them with referrals in the health center. These private providers charge for their services, but the fees are set in a transparent manner, one that both meets the need of the provider, but also is something that communities can afford. Finally, availability and quality of service delivery, as well as fees, are remotely monitored in a community-led process in which the local government, health workers, and community members participate. This community support system, a locally-led multi-stakeholder group that meets regularly to monitor services and identify and solve challenges, is the foundation of this effort. So is it working? We asked ourselves. And we've seen some remarkable improvements. For example, after 18 months, there were significant increases in skilled birth attendance, antenatal care, and postnatal care, with 50% of births now attended by skilled birth attendants versus 11 at baseline. Importantly, these providers are replacing unskilled providers, not displacing existing skilled government providers. Further, they were appropriately referring clients for emergency services. Also, Despite fee for service nature of the program, the services are reaching the poorest. 68% of service recipients were either poor or ultra poor. We also supported this new cadre with training and building a business. And at 18 months, more than a third, 33% of the providers had reached the benchmark for financial viability and 15% had achieved financial sustainability. But beyond anticipating, absorbing, and adapting to conditions, we need to transform conditions and the drivers of risk. And these drivers are rooted in inequality. Inequality in the distribution of power, information, and resources. And we know that women and girls are often the most affected by these inequalities. Economic, natural, social shocks and stressors have a disproportionate impact on the lives of women and children. This is true in conflict and crisis settings, where 60% of all maternal deaths take place in humanitarian crisis and all forms of gender-based violence spike. This is true in epidemics. During Ebola, women died at higher rates, saw increased maternal, newborn, and infant deaths as patients feared seeking treatment. This is true in natural disasters. Studies among pregnant women after Hurricane Katrina found low birth weight was higher in women with high hurricane exposure versus women uh, without higher exposure. And this is true of the daily stressors of life and poverty. Gender discrimination means that women experience poverty differently with fewer resources to cope. Among other things, they're likely to be last to eat and the ones least likely to access healthcare. However, as my colleagues have so well pointed out, women are also the sources of power and resilience and change and um, our frame takes this to heart. So we ask why women and girls are, moved, are more vulnerable to shock and stressors. One of the key underlying drivers of risk is unequal social and gender norms that constrain women and girls' ability to access information, services, and supplies they need to make reproductive health decisions and exercise their rights. To challenge these norms, we have developed an approach called Social Analysis in Action, or SAA to catalyze dialogue and reflection on gender inequality, sexuality, and family planning. 
We've used it with couples to improve communication and reproductive decision making, with communities to challenge norms that reinforce gender inequality and inhibit reproductive health, and with providers to increase their awareness of their own beliefs and attitudes and to improve the quality of their interactions with women and adolescent girls seeking sexual and reproductive health services. For example, we use this approach in Ethiopia to catalyze dialogue and reflection and prompt change. This program called TESFA focused on married adolescent girls in Ethiopia. The TESFA program brought married adolescent girls for a year's curriculum on sexual and reproductive health, communication, and negotiation skills. And these groups also provided important social and emotional support through peer facilitated dialogue. The program also engaged others in the community, elders, religious leaders, mothers-in-laws, husbands, community health workers in a parallel 12-month curriculum, encouraging them to re-examine the traditions of early marriage and gaining their support for family planning and more equitable sharing of household responsibilities and decision making. We conducted an evaluation and found some significant improvements just after one year. Use of family planning methods rose by 27%. Participants also reported greater confidence in communicating timing and spacing of pregnancies and contraceptive use with husbands. Husbands showed increased support of, of family planning and finally families and influential community members also increased their support for family planning and joined together to directly prevent 180 child marriages. Another approach we've used to transform the underlying conditions and drivers of risk is called the community scorecard. This is an approach that builds trust through expanding space for dialogue and negotiation between communities and healthcare workers. It is a unique process that brings together community members, service providers, and local authorities to identify service utilization and prevention challenges, or in provision challenges rather yet, and to generate local solutions to these challenges and then work in partnership to implement and track the effectiveness of those solutions in an ongoing process. It is a tool that has been used to build trust to expand spaces for negotiation, to lift up underrepresented voices, to and to hold those in power accountable. In 2012, we implemented the community secure card in one district in Malawi to study the impact that this approach has on reproductive health and maternal health outcomes. And in just one year, the, the results were quite impressive. So this looks, the first set of charts looks at a six month follow-up process of the indicators, and um, the latter looks at it at the end of one year. Um, and we see, I mean, this is, I think, true of many of the communities where the community scorecard is utilized. You see sort of this, this significant jump in, in the indicators that communities and providers have identified together. Um, and that has a lot to do with, with the space that it creates for negotiation and conversations around what health provision um, can look like and the ways it can be improved. <coughs> There are important things to be done in both development and humanitarian settings to anticipate, absorb, adapt programs, and transform conditions and support a more resilient health system. Increasing resilience is one of the pillars of CARE's approach to programming. And over the years, we have learned that a community is a critical to an effective, responsive, and resilient health system. Some important lessons include always ask why. Women, girls, households, and communities are vulnerable to shock and stressors, and don't be content with treating the symptoms. Focus on the underlying causes and drivers of risk, and do not place the responsibility to be resilient on the communities. Increase gender equality and strengthen women's voices. Increase fears in which women and girls can make decisions. Expand the psychological, physical, social, emotional, political, and economic space so that they can exercise choice. Just and equitable systems where women, girls, and vulnerable groups are able to exercise agency, power, and influence is also more effective, resilient, and sustainable systems. Build understanding and trust between the community and health delivery system. And the continuum between development and emergency work is increasingly blurred. We need a health system that goes beyond brick and mortar, that is underpinned by strong communication networks that links the community with the health delivery system. Good communication can reduce fear and help people feel more and control their lives. When communities and emergency responders work together, we save time, money, and ultimately lives. A resilience frame also <coughs> 
allows us to better understand the interconnectedness of systems and promote comprehensive partnerships to work across the many factors, from the individual to the global. It views communities as key actors in building a resilient system and thus works to build local capacity and thus sustainability. And it invites us to put women at the center and partner with those who are most impacted in shaping and naming their solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Mitrabse um, and, and Christine. There's a lot in there. Um, and I was quite struck by your example of the community scorecard that, that you talk about in the context of Malawi. So most recently, we had with us for a year President Joyce Bonder from Malawi, who worked with us on our maternal health program for a year at the center. And in talking to President Bonder, she said one of the most difficult things for her in thinking about how to develop a resilient health system in Malawi is to think about how do you deal with the traditional beliefs at the community level, tribal beliefs, particularly with regard to young girls and adolescent sexuality, uh, reproductive health, and rights. And she said this by far was um, one of her greatest missions as, as a um, president. I, I wonder whether you and Christine could talk a little bit about that. You know, very often when we talk about these issues, I am challenged by colleagues who say you're trying to change our culture. Um, and this links to, to, to be traditional beliefs. How do we address this space of looking at cultural beliefs if we're talking about redeveloping resilient health systems? That's a good question. And let me give an example. In Malawi, actually, in a district where we work, um, several communities, several groups were trained on the CS community scorecard. And really, the strength of this tool is that it brings together providers, community members, in space for dialogue and create space for dialogue and negotiation. Um, and uh, in attendance as part of the space for dialogue and negotiation were youth who were not particularly trained on this tool, but thought this was a really useful tool for them to implement, and they did. They implemented it across multiple communities. They were a well-organized um, group of folks and used it to, to, for example, create bylaws with chiefs around ch early child marriage, um, uh, sort of lobby for access to um, facilities that are youth friendly. Um, they, they had solar power because they realized one of the primary issues in their facilities was that there was not enough electricity. So they, they, cr they managed through this process to bring in solar power into some of these communities. So yes, I, it, it's, it's an important question to ask. And in many ways, communities themselves are shifting those traditions. Um, so it's, it's, not it's not even an idea coming from elsewhere. Right, and I, I think very often we hear that, well, culture and cultural beliefs are also evolving. It's not static, mm -hmm. so how do you push those levels? Let's open it up. I have lots of other questions I'd like to ask, but we really want to hear from you. So I would say, um, if, raise your hand if you have a question. Give your name and affiliation and get quickly to your question or comment as we have people who are also tuning in online and we'd like to be able to also get uh, to Christine to see if she has any comments or thoughts on the phone. So any questions, comments, thoughts, reactions that, that you have? Seeing lots of hands. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi. Hi. Yeah, that's Christine. I think. So, so Christine, we'll get you. Let's take a question and we'll come to you. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Kate Wilson and I'm uh, representing Management Sciences for Health. And thanks so much to the panelists. I had a question um, for Joan or Joanne? Joanne. Joanne, sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, so I love how you kind of painted this picture of w this already g resilient group of women who had already created a lot of change in Liberia's history, and then that they really drove the response to Ebola and that think went alongside them. And I was just wondering what you, what is the next step for some of these women change makers in the community? Um, now that we're getting post Ebola, what role might they play in helping 
the health system to rebuild or to be resilient to future uh, crises? Thank you. So I think that's, that's a good question. You know, so you have the, the, the crisis that you deal with. What happens post-crisis? How do you continue to rebuild and make that sustainable too? Um, so that's, that's one question. Um, was there a question or comment on the phone? Christine? Yes. I just had um, a comment in response to your last question, Roger Mark. Please. About the culture issue. And I just wanted to add that we, you know, we know that um, communities and culture is not monolithic. And there are many, many different voices in communities. And I think what... Um, part of what the community scorecard and a lot of the participatory kinds of approaches that the other speakers were talking about is really an effort to lift up some of those underrepresented voices and the voices that aren't often heard and make sure that um, there's really a, you know, a representation of all of the voices in the community about what's needed. And, and so I, I just wanted to add that. And then the one other thing, I thought your other question was really good about does kind of focusing on the community really potentially let off the hook some of the people who actually have at the moment a lot more power and to make you know decisions uh, at a national level or, or higher. And you know, I think that's a really, really good question. I think we... We certainly hope not. We hope by lifting up those voices um, and accompanying people and supporting that community-led and driven kind of action is what's going to drive those policymakers and those decision makers at other levels to take the actions they need to take to um, change those those things at a systematic level. But that is, a, I think, a really a really good question, and I think we always have to be careful not to, um, you know, in our programs, end up kind of focusing the responsibility entirely on the community. So, thank you. Thank you. I think that's that's great. Um, Christine, I wondered whether you had any thoughts on the question that was also raised before we get to Joanne, which is after the initial response or recovery, how do we, in, in a post- Ebola, post-disaster situation, how do we move to ensure that resilience is sustained? Any thoughts that you might have, Christine, before we get to the others on the panel? Uh, yes, I, I don't think I have any, you know, particularly um, brilliant thoughts, but I do think it kind of points back to the fact that we no longer really live in a world where there's an easy divide between kind of development and humanitarian spaces, and that focusing on building a resilient health system is really has to happen all of the time. And that whether it's pre or post doesn't matter. That these um, community groups and community voices, things like health committees that really work um, are, you know, are really, the, as um, our colleague from Haiti said, the kind of the cornerstone of the health system really need to be present all of the time, and we need to find ways to support those groups. I think, you know, there's also, as you point out, some real challenges. You know, how do, how do we finance those kinds of activities and those kinds of groups? How do we... Um, you know, make sure that focus is there, that it's really built in, it's built into our surveillance systems and our finance systems and our entire um, infrastructure building systems. I think those are some big, big challenges, but um, I think critical. Great, thank, thank you very much. Joanne, what do you think? Post Ebola, what's next? Yes, what is next? Uh, we, that's why we work strictly with the community we involve, we integrate the services within the community activities to make it sustainable. In uh, our resident girls, we have a lot of uh, activities for them. We have the economic empowerment for our resident girls. 
where they learn the business development skills. They are trained in business development skills. They are trained in leadership and decision making. They are trained in um, how to manage their finance and we set them into a network, a network of 15 and we have 10 members and five leaders. And this network, we have a startup kit that is given to them and they pool their money together and we call it the very saving loans. The very saving loan is they pull their money together and loan it to each other with small percentage and at the end of the year, all of them have funding, you know, something and then continue with the principle. So this system are in place and personally, the girls are working. They have now opened their Facebook account and every issue that is in the community that is affecting them, they make sure to report those cases. They are engaging communities or members because they have the skills of leadership, leadership training and decision making. Um, another thing, they have a youth friendly center that they meet. And in those youth friendly centers, we have people that are trained to also offer some services uh, or the commodities of sexual reproductive health. And that in that uh, 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 youth friendly centers, they are where they sit and discuss issues because this is something that has been lacking. And you find out that most of our adolescent girls don't want to go to our health center in Liberia because it's not youth friendly. Most of the time, they discriminate them. You are a low age, why small girl are you? Why are you coming to access reproductive health? Something. So we have youth centers and in, within the community. And after we train, do the, the training in sexual reproductive health, we don't leave them like that. We link them with health facilities so they can be able to access the commodities. And also we have potential women in the communities that we use as mentor for them. Who uh, We have one uh, potential women to five girls who follow up on those girls and make sure that they access their reproductive, reproductive health services. So that is sustainable because they have all of the knowledge and they are moving forward and they are taking the lead in their communities. So, Joanne, one of the things that, that struck me um, when you were talking earlier is that you had mentioned initially there was no in internal funding and there, there was this need to go out and engage partners externally, both for, to develop strategies but also for funding. As, uh, as a result of that, were there more internal sources of funding that were generated? And how do you keep um, the funding for this kind of holistic approach that you talk about, how do you keep that coming? How do you keep that sustainable? How do you sustain the funding? Well, for thing Liberia, uh, that's uh, a gap we have, but we try to empower our community in as much to take the lead. And community engagement, actually, we make them to integrate the service into their community because looking at funding, you know, if you make the community to look more at funding, like for example, for prevention, um, information or education, you just give them the information and they go out. Because the gap that we had, like for example, we have the community dialogues at first, we started giving them some squash cards, some materials, and whenever the squash cards is not there, they don't want to perform their duties. So we integrated, we told them to integrate it into their community activities. So whatever the community uh, forms they generate, the, uh, uh, that aspect is included. And for Think Liberia, we have our website, and we have more people donating to us, and that's how you see we have a standard funding. Because we have a gap in Liberia, we have the government don't want to release funding to local or CBO. And that's a gap we have during the Ebola. 
if we never have extended funding, we will have moved the way we move and got community involved. Great. Okay, thank you. I think we have a couple of questions here. Yeah, yeah. yeah so if you can, the microphone. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maria uh, White. Uh, I want to thank uh, Joanne for uh, everything she is doing and is going to do. Um, uh, I have uh, uh, some... Uh, I, I'm very interested in Liberia and uh, uh, doing a lot of things for it, so I want to talk with you about it later. Uh, I studied public health in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, I missed a little bit the time frame and everything because when you are, uh, have people who have a traditional thinking and you want to change that or you want to improve that, uh, that takes time. And I always tell people, you know, put uh, your uh, 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 cup with salt somewhere else in the kitchen. I'm going to tell you it is going to take a long time before you are going immediately to that new place because you are used to it that's there for years in the old place so it takes time for people uh, 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 to change and um, I don't say improve because I don't know if every change is also immediately an improvement that's also a new thing um, uh, I think when you're talking about funding uh, I work together with my husband in a company and uh, uh, we see also when there is a lot of funding from external then uh, that you get a new problem towards it and that is fraud and corruption mm -hmm. that's everywhere in, in, in the world and es especially when there is a disaster it is very important to know where is the money going and is it coming to the people who need it now with the um, uh, with uh, Hurricane Irma and Harvey, there's the same problem again. Mm -hmm. eh? Where's the money going to stay? Um, I think those are very important things to take with you. And I think also uh, uh, only funding from extern is not enough you need also the funding from intern. Uh, economic uh, uh, improvement is important, the infrastructure and uh, the facilities. And when are you going to those villages? During a harvest period, the women don't come because they need to work. During a rainy season, very difficult because they can't travel. So there's always, there are so many aspects to think of and to do together. Um, NGOs want to have quick results because they need to, to show their donors. But quick, <laughs> quick results means that you're only improving symptoms mm -hmm. instead of yeah. the problem. Yeah. So yeah, th these were a little bit thoughts which were going through my mind and uh, uh, yeah, I know there's too much to give an answer for all those questions, Great. but mm, that's something. But I think you raised a number of critical points that we could ask all of our panelists uh, to, to talk about. So how do you get to the root causes of these problems? That's one point that I think you make. I think you also talk about providing services. You talk about hard and soft services. So your infrastructure and facilities, but also additional services. So what's that right balance? How do you deal with accountability for funding when you have to deal with questions of fraud and corruption? And then what's the time frame uh, for change? What's realistic? What can you expect to accomplish in a short term? And what you accomplish in a short term, how might that set the basis for longer term impacts and, and, and um, systemic change. So, um, Topsy, can we start with you? Absolutely. Um, and one or any of the above? Uh, who won? <laughs> um, I think in, in thinking about root causes, some of the things that come to mind are, are uh, issues that all of the panelists have touched upon. It's the, the, the need to cr create processes and systems of trust and accountability 
um, the CSC that I talked about in the presentation is one mechanism, but creating and expanding spaces for having dialogue, conversation, and accountability, I think, are critical in, in building trust between providers and individuals, between providers and broader systems. Mm. Um, also, uh, partnerships that work across the system, so from the household individual community level to broader, more uh, global um, players. And then value, um, I mean, really seeing the value of the innovative intersectional work that communities do on a daily basis to be resilient, although <laughs> uh, you raise an, imp an important point there, um, and the ways to be to re do recovery work. So I think really changing our lens even to, to um, shift and give voice and value to the work that happens in community. Let, let me just push you on one point that, that you raise. <laughs> yes, please. So this question of value, you know, we, we talk very often about these holistic development approaches. We talk about bridging the gap and the divide between development and humanitarian assistance. We talk about developing indicators of integration that measure this value added. The donors don't want this. They really do not care. You know, they are being held accountable for the health sector. They want the health indicators. If they're in the environment sector, they want the environment indicators. They want to know how you're moving the needle on their specific issue. They're not particularly interested in the value added. And, and they are even less interested in times of constrained um, availability of resources. It is very often the first kinds of programs that are cut. So, yes, we recognize the, the, the need to measure this value, but how do we get to it? It's, it really is tough, no? No, I agree, it's tough. And I do think that there are some shifts that are happening within the broader funding world even, in terms of valuing, uh, giving space for, for more comprehensive holistic approaches that center community, um, and not being driven sort of by meta, indicators <laughs> necessarily. Um, and then the flip side though is if we don't have these shifts, then th what jo Joanne speaks of is that organizations who are doing the important necessary work at the forefront often don't have access to the funding that they need. So in the middle of doing the response, comprehensive response, they were also sort of, you know, trying to find partners who could help in, in supporting them in that process. So I think that it's, it's an important conversation. I think it is one that is coming along, and there have been some big players who have made shift around who they fund mm -hmm. um, and the kinds of projects they fund. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's a long-term okay. process. Great, thank you, Rikirli. What are, could what could are you thinking? Sure, yes, well? please. <laughs> um, I just, I agree, and I think, um, you know, that's true, that it's hard sometimes to make the case, but there's now a lot of research that shows that community involvement, community engagement, um, things like mother's groups in Bangladesh um, showing impact on reducing maternal and newborn mortality. The scorecard, we just did a randomized trial and there's some other trials in place. And so I think providing those donors who do right, those are the indicators they care about, those and health outcomes with the kind of evidence they value um, as well as probably doing more kind of cost effectiveness type analysis to really show the show them the business case for uh, this really matters. I mean, I think the, the, the photo that Atopsi showed at the beginning of her presentation about the cholera treatment center being burned down, well, that's, you know, you lose a lot of value there when you don't take the steps necessary to really um, engage the community and, and build <coughs> Right the first time, so thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. What are you thinking? Yeah, I think that uh, all that we have discussed here actually fit in all the gaps that we need to address in order to allow communities to grow, uh, to become resilient. And as Joanna has presented it, all the difficulties that uh, it, it her organization has in order to find uh, funding for this kind of intervention. And it, it goes uh, in alignment with what I've mentioned, talking about difficulties for population in survival mode, you know, to engage uh, in collective action. But we need um, 
in general, you know, as a community of experts, development experts at the global level to make a plea to help change the tide, change the paradigm. So we, co we do more advocacy, so international agencies start, you know, support this kind of intervention that can foster, that can bolster endogenous development. Because if we keep, or they keep financing in the, you know, in the scheme that we have described, the scheme that we know, it will be very difficult to really to make a difference. But if we come together and, you know, um, brainstorm, analyze, evaluate what the, 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 the I mean, the world we, we, we work through so far and the, the results we're able to, to have and see how we actually can have more bank for the, your buck, you, how you say that, more money. More bank yeah. for your buck. Yeah, exactly. So, and this is what it is about. It's about efficiency. It's about uh, sustainability. It's about autonomy of those communities that have been assisted for a long time. So let's put them in the driver's seat. So l let me ask you, um, you know, very often I'm held accountable by my, my um, sons. So when I go home, they say, okay, dad, what did you do today? You hosted another dialogue. Great. What did people talk about? Okay. And I'll say, okay, I had, I had, you know, it's fascinating OBGYN from Haiti. And, and my son will say to me, Haiti, it's a really tough situation. So I need you to give me an answer for my dinner table conversation tonight, which is, what do you think is the most positive story coming out of Haiti that we can tell others to demonstrate the possibility and power of resilience? You know, we, we, I think as a community, we always feel Haiti is being hammered again and again and again. And, you know, we want to get away from this narrative of poor Haiti, right? Give us a powerful empowering story about the possibility of what's possible in Haiti for me to share at my dinner table tonight. But you know, the fact that we're able to survive the powerful earthquake, we're able and people get back on their feet, they start rebuilding of the, the, of the country, people are smiling on the street even though they are living, they're in a hardship, uh, economical hardship. People have hope and people are uh, now i think uh, there is a big difference between what people are seeing on the press about haiti and the reality that the the, the, the population is living and um people are trying to and uh, currently they are very they want to move they want to take their their life in their hands. They want to work and make uh, a living for themselves. And they, as I've mentioned in our program, and I'd like to say that the reserve of the country is actually in the countryside. You know, the people living out of the big cities, out of corruption scheme and so forth. So we have seen people, let's say, that are putting their meager means together to support each other. And the example that I've provided regarding MISO, the MISO is kind of the, so the, soci the social solidarity funds that those people put together. And this is an example that this is a kind of intervention that needs to be supported. Not to be controlled, but to be supported and leave it to the end of the people that have taken it. So you do, can you hear that? This is, this is, finan is this kind of a finan uh, financial system, I mean, finan financement of the health system, when people are putting money together so they can help each other go to have their visit, to have their medical visit, to support each other, to be able to pay for medicine. Those are not supported by any kind of uh, agencies. Generally, when you have a you receive a grant to provide services, they, they don't do not cover that. And this is one of one of the impediments to access to services. But they, they find a way to organize themselves to support that. And people are working together, you know, in the field, you know, in the agricultural uh, agriculture area. People are working together to 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 harvest, 
they are working together to plant. You see what I mean? So there is a sense of hope and there is a sense of autonomy. But sometimes it actually is very bizarre, but this is sometimes the way the, the help is being provided, the support is being provided that is spoiling this natural tendency of really uh, taking their life into, in, in, into their hands. You see what, you yep. see what I mean? Yep. So I think basically we need to change the paradigm and you know, start doing things in looking at the real needs of the people we want to help. I think that's a really important point, and which is why I'm so glad that on the panel we've really focused on this community approach. We know from the analyses and studies that have been done about building resilience at a community level, but also building resilient systems um, has a strong focus on social capital, and that is tied to networks and community support mechanisms. And I think that is the story that you're telling, which is very compelling on an anecdotal level, but it's also being systematically supported by research at a community level looking at what builds resilience and what are the, the building blocks of resilience. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you say this. Joanne, what are, what are your thoughts? Uh, for me, this is uh, a gap in Liberia. At before, we're looking, I'm looking at the funding. Okay, the funding is given directly to the government. And government in Liberia, like for the Ministry of Health, they want to do the implementation. And who questions them? Nobody will question them. So that funding remains at the Ministry of Health. And then the Ministry of Health decides how to use the funding. And that I don't know if the uh, donors who are sending the funding, what are they doing gender budgeting? The funding just come, there is no gender budgeting. How much we go to children, for children, how much for the health system. The bulk of the funding just come in the ministry account, and the ministry uh, decide what to do with the funding. And looking at the community, the communities have to identify issues that is affecting them. Not you caring or issue that is not important to them. So you see, that's our gap we have. And I gave an example of the, uh, the Ebola. We could not access funding. We went out to get community involved. We went out to move in. I mean, maybe some of uh, the people that died would have died if we had funding from the initial state. But funding, there were no funding. We have to get funding from external. And that's the issue we have in Liberia. And you as a national NGO, if you speak too much, government will not give you accreditation. And we are faced with that. We are just living with it. We can ask them why it is like this. I mean, there were so many funny have been sent. So Liberia, when you hear the amount, you wonder, where is the funding going? So I mean, my recommendation funding should be given directly to national NGOs because they are closer to the community and they know the issues of the community. But funding is given at the top and then it's not reaching at the bottom. Great. So uh, time is almost up. We'll take two quick questions, but I want to remind you that we have a reception afterwards. So you're going to have an opportunity to engage on a one-to-one -on -one basis over some food and drink. So please stay and ask those questions. So we take a couple of quick questions, um, and then we wrap up and go to our reception. Hi, my name is Wilma Mui, and I work with the World Faith Development Dialogue. And we are very interested, and we work at the intersection of religion and development. So when we're talking about communities and working at that level, I wanted to ask um, all our panelists um, if they have engaged religious communities, religious leaders in any systematic way in general, and specifically in the sexual reproductive health realm. Great, thank you. And I think we had one question in the back here. 
Hi, my name is Ochi Ibe, and I work with um, ICF and the, on the Maternal Child Survival Program. And I had two questions, one for uh, Joanne. Um, I could talk about Liberia, but I, do, I don't want to be specific right now. I just wanted to ask you, how are you channeling your, your thoughts and um, your activities in terms of resilient communities towards you know, the upcoming election? Liberia is going to have the first chance you know, to have a, a leaving president hand over to another one. And so how are you mobilizing the community to be able to ad, you know, ad, articulate some of these concerns that you have in terms of you know, resilience and the systems that we have raised you know, to bring about the change in terms of holding the, the the uh, elected people accountable. And then my other question was to um, Dr. Frederick, um, and um, um, thanks for what you shared about what is happening in Haiti. And just my con um, contribution or comment is about how the community is being empowered to be able to advocate, because a lot of the challenges you raised are systemic issues. And so how is the community getting a voice to be able to raise the, you know, the, their, their concerns at the highest level to bring about systemic change in government? Thank you. Great, thank you. So some great questions. And I'll add one as we wrap up. What do you know now in your work that you wish you knew five years ago? What do you know today? And you say, gosh, if I knew that five years ago, I would have made even more progress. So you could address one or any of those questions. How are you engaging faith leaders, a religious community? How do you deal with electoral politics? How do you position around upcoming elections? How are you helping communities to continue to have a voice? What do you know now that you wish you knew uh, five years ago? So um, Christine, can we start with you quickly on the phone? One or, uh, one or two of those questions? programming always um, involves the, all the key kind of community stakeholders and influential people in a community. And so in most cases, religious leaders are part of that community. Mm -hmm. And many and, and possibly religious leaders from several different faiths. Faith. So um, I think it can be done. And it's again about having a conversation and trying to find the common ground um, raising issues that you know in terms of how some of the for example gender or social or religious norms and taboos are having a, a negative impact and an impact that those very same religious leaders religious leaders do not want to see in their communities and so trying to enlist them in ways that um, they're comfortable to support the overall um, health and positive uh, outcomes and well-being of the, the women and girls, particularly in their communities. And so we've seen a lot of success in doing that, and it's definitely uh, really, really critical. Great. So I'll stop with that. And let Thank you. Me. Thank you. Joanne, one, one of the questions? Well, um, she asked the question about what are we doing for our next election, and we have a female president, and now people are saying they will not vote women because <laughs> the female have failed them. So there was a study done by UN Women, and it came out with a manual on women political participation. Mm -hmm. And we have trained our young women and adolescent girls along with the male informant. They were trained to go out in communities to start to create the awareness on women, the importance of women political participation. And looking at, we look at the fact sheets that looking in government, you seeing that Ellen has failed you, the president has failed you, and that women have failed you. We look on our governments, we see that we have more men than even women. So we, we need to have both men and women putting ideas on the table to move Liberia forward. 
And this is something that we are, is ongoing now. The training, we conducted the training and now it's ongoing. They are moving up now into their community, encouraging women to post, vote for potential women to take up posts because it's a serious challenge. It's a serious gap we have now. Men are seeing traditional norms, gender norms that women are not to be in power. And we broke that norms because we know that gender can change. And we had our first female president that went for two terms. So we are working towards this and encouraging more women to participate. Even though there are a lot of barriers, barriers when it comes to women participation in politics. Uh, people tend to attack her personality, the woman personality, and sometimes the women don't have the confidence. They don't have finances, resources to run. So we have more women that were coming up, but it has to drop. They can't make it. They didn't have the finances because you know campaign. Campaigning is very expensive. Now I have my boss, who is the, uh, the executive director for thing. She's running in the race now. She's running for a representative in her district, Riverside District number one. And the man told her, no, you have to sit down. She said, no, I'm going. And she said, I'm in a race because I'm vexed. River says it's underdeveloped. There are a lot of law and policy just placed in the house. Like, for example, the domestic violence law, they have not even touched that. The uh, farmatory bill, we asked for just 30%, they gave 7%. So we are encouraging more women. We are working on that now, more women to be in the house. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Sounds like we have a lot to talk about during our reception. <laughs> Thank you. Ricardo, what about you? Yeah, well, I will, I will be addressing the four questions. Uh, did you, um, step by step? Probably have time for yeah, one. I'll go, I'll go fast. I'll go yeah. fast. I'll go fast. So, um, <laughs> item for the religious leaders, yes, we did uh, in our work, we engaged with them. Um, you know, traditional um, leaders, you know, the Wungan and also the you know, the priests and pastors. So in most of the work we are doing we now, uh, for, you know, reproductive health, you know, maternal health and family planning, it was rewarding to see how when we involve them, we inform them, we discuss with them, they, they have been contributing, you know, for the leaders and the organ you know, to refer patients, refer cases that they cannot manage. So the week, we, we've been building this, you know, parallel, I mean, working in this parallel world and put some bridge so we can co uh, collaborate. And recently, an event for family planning in, the, in those religious institutions, Catholic institutions, they accept to do the counseling even though they might not be providing direct to the, 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 the products to the clients. Um, I, I really like the question the lady asked over there about... Uh, how we manage to really address those structural issues that I've mentioned. Yes, we have a lot of barriers, but we are confident that by applying this scheme of community mobilization, the way we are doing it, actually this is what we're expecting at down the road. Down the road, we will have a more empowered community that will be able to engage, and then with its participation, that will really uh, be able to engage in change within this community. So this grassroots movement will definitely, once we, we are able to have a standardized community mobilization framework that is adopted by the Ministry of Health, we are working on it. So, so we can have a basis, so we have a guideline that everybody will follow. And we, we are confident that by working uh, with this tool, we will have at the different level of the, of the system, the healthcare system, from the community, uh, from the household to the community, going on to the different level of, up to the departmental and regional level, will be able to make a difference. And for your question uh, uh, regarding what I knew, if I knew something five years ago, I think um, 
definitely as a physician, the way I've been training, even working as a public health specialist, we we were kind of biased by thinking that we have to come every to do everything for the community. So adopting this paternalist approach, deciding, oh, this is what you have as a disease, this is how I'm going to to treat you. So now we are more on a listening mode and uh, building partnership and uh, in order to, to move forward and address the issues together. And this definitely makes me understand that everybody counts and we cannot go past people and decide for them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I'll very quickly talk to um, the, what I wish I knew five years ago. Um, it's very similar to yours. I think it is putting the, the partnership and the collaborative work first. Um, no single organization or individual can address the seismic long-term changes that we want to make, and it requires the whole of us. So having those at the forefront, at the planning stage, as much as anything else. Wow, so we, we, we covered um, quite a bit today. What, what a panel. I was really pleased that we started by a general framing of resilience. And I think we heard very different approaches and definitions of resilience. I think we discussed resilience as a skill, resilience as a way of operating, resilience as a point of action, as a leverage point, as a negotiating factor. But I must say, I really love Joanne's definition of resilience. You cope with it, you move ahead, and you take action. Um, you brass tacks, this is what it is about, this is what we encapsulate in resilience. So most of our discussion has involved how do you take this aspect of resilience with regards to health system strengthening and what does it mean to focus at the community level? A lot of the examples and discussions that we had about working with and working in a community um, involved really thinking of mechanisms to develop trust and engagement. And I think this came across the panelists, um, was really very critical. And we saw some really interesting mechanisms and um, examples of community level reporting, accountability. Um, in Haiti, we heard about the community being the cornerstone of health systems. We heard about a very interesting community action plan, um, opportunities for mobilization, community participation. So really um, a foundational approach to developing resilience in health systems at um, with starting with the community. But what did this, this mean in terms of mobilizing communities? I was quite um, pleased to hear a number of our panelists talk about motivation and hope. How do you create an image of hope that really pushes communities to act? And how do you use a holistic approach to get there? This holistic approach was talked about in terms of framing, but we also heard an example from Liberia of having a one-stop shop for integrated service delivery that covered many aspects. It wasn't just one type of service being delivered. We heard examples from Haiti of, of communities that were doing health interventions, water interventions, reforestation interventions in a very real, practical, non-siloed way. We heard about CARE's work in working with a holistic system that focuses on care, delivery, and a space for engagement. So I think across our panelists, we heard about this holistic approach being cut and diced different ways, and really looking at how we bring together the development and humanitarian work, and what it means to being integrated into a number of, of activities. I was also very pleased that we talked about gaps. We didn't leave it there. There are a number of difficulties and struggles. We talked about systemic challenges in the healthcare system. Uh, we talked about power dynamics. I was quite taken with the phrase that we heard from Haiti. You're living in, when you're living in a survival mode, you're less inclined to be involved in political action. I thought that was a very powerful statement. We talked about gaps in engagement and participation when communities are left out and inequities in cares approach and framing to his to its work particularly when we take into account differential vulnerabilities so what is being done to address these gaps certainly we heard a number of examples of partnership um, partnership that involved internal and external actors for strategizing for funding for leveraging we heard examples from care public private partnership and we heard um, opportunities of partnership across systems but we also heard about 
about a number of innovations. We heard of dignity kits from Liberia and solidarity funds from Haiti. We heard of a community called La Victoire, um, Victory. What a, a great name for a community that is serving as a living example of what it means to succeed in this area. We heard of interesting tools and approaches that are pushing participatory engagement mechanisms to another level from our colleagues at CARE, talking about social analysis and action, a community scorecard, and the importance, the importance of in connectedness of, of systems. Wow, you guys <laughs> covered quite a bit. So please join me in thanking our panel. I'm really pleased that we had a, a very nuanced discussion, and that discussion will continue. I'd like to uh, particularly recognize my colleague Sarah Barnes in pulling together today's uh, session. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we also, um, this has been recorded. We have a video archive of it that's available to you. The presentations will also be available to you. And we will write up a summary of the highlights of our discussion today, which will also be available on our website. So you'll have the video of the session, the presentations, and some notes from the session. So please continue to engage. Please stay, drink, eat, be merry, network, and ask further questions. So thank you very much. Thank you.